Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the EICC. In the latest of our Innovation Nation series, uh, where tonight we're going to be focused on the extremely fast-pacing robotics industry. And it's great to see uh, some of our Innovation Nation regulars this evening, and it's also good to welcome uh, some new ones to our Innovation Nation series. I'm sure that you'll all enjoy this evening's uh, discussion, um, where it's free to attend. And um, talks the, this evening, we have two talks delivered by two experts um, who've given up their free time this evening uh, to, to, um, to be present with us tonight. Earlier this year, the EICC welcomed the largest robotics, robotics network event in Europe when we hosted the European Robotics Forum. The event attracted over 800 of Europe's leading scientists, companies and policymakers who were able to exchange their views on some world-changing ideas within the robotics industry. This is very much the essence of Innovation Nation and also the EICC's new vision statement, which is to create an environment which inspires ideas to change the world. Now, our first speaker tonight is Dr. Tusha Rajendran of the Edinburgh Centre for Robotics to talk about what robots tell us about ourselves. Tusha will be followed by uh, Professor Ruth Eilert of Heriot Watts Mathematics and Computer Science Department, who will discuss creating robots that care. <clears throat> so, um, if you'd like to ask our speakers any questions uh, this evening, there'll be a question and answer session once both presentations have concluded. But now, please welcome this evening's first guest speaker, Dr. Tusha. Rajendrand. So thank you very much for that introduction and thank you very much everyone for coming tonight. Um, what I'm going to be talking about is what robots tell us uh, about mm -hmm. ourselves. Um, and I'm a psychologist, and I work with Ruth and colleagues who are computer scientists. And as we try and understand robots and build better robots, we find that we need each other in a way that uh, we haven't done before. Um, as with many people, my first introduction to robots was through uh, the art form of the last century, which is the cinema. And I hope to show you uh, through my slides and my presentation about how art and science, especially in this format, kind of merge together and how they need each other. Um, I'm giving my age away here, but uh, uh, Disney's Black Hole was one of the first films that I saw with robots and immediately fell in love with them. Um, Roddy McDowell voiced the wonderful Vincent. There's also Bob and the evil Maximilian. Fast forward 30 years later, uh, there's a photograph of me with Pepper, one of the most widely available and popular robots at the moment. Commercially available uh, to you for 20,000 pounds. Um, the price is something that will undoubtedly come down, um, but what we try and do as psychologists is to make robots available to, to us and uh, make, them, make us want to work with them. So I guess as my starting point, um, I don't want to get too political, but we did have an election not so long ago, if you can bear to think about it, and one of the things that came up was about the social care crisis and how we deal with this, an aging population. If you notice, in this slide here, we have Pepper the robot interacting with people in Japan. And Pepper is very popular. In fact, uh, Pepper, I believe, is used by one of the banks as a front of house. And you see Pepper interacting with these elderly individuals here. Um, anybody seen Robot and Frank? It's a fantastic film, both funny and poignant, and sort of explores some of these ideas Eventually, I think he's a retired bank robber or something like that and starts, starts to rob banks again or starts to be a jewel thief. Um, so here we have uh, art and science melding together to inform each other. One thing is for certain is that we love robots. There's no doubt about it. As I go through these slides, you'll see, wow, 
I recognize that robot, I recognize that robot. The first iconic robot, really, in cinema was uh, Maria. So iconic, in fact, that it's become part of popular culture for Metropolis. And she was designed by the evil genius Dr. Rockbang. Um, well, R2-D2 and cp 3 hardly need uh, any introduction, but uh, George Lucas used them in a very interesting way. Um, he watched the film Hidden Fortress by um, Akira Kurosawa, and here um, the story is told from the lowest possible denomination, and uh, they're the peasants. So I'll come back to this theme as robots, as peasants, as, as servants, and how we view them later on. Um, but they tell this fantastic seascape of a story of a space opera through this very, very low level sort of um, viewpoint. And that's how uh, George Lucas used them. And they have the wonderful KS, uh, K2SO from Rogue One. Uh, Chappie, wonderful film from South Africa, uh, also gives us an indication of how um, we view ourselves. And uh, Short Circuit from the 1980s. So this is Johnny Five. Well, we like robots an awful lot. Ex Machina. Um, a wonderful film, um, Wally uh, comes, you know, very sort of existential film, comes from a silent running tradition of loneliness. Uh, one of my favorite robots, and I'll come to him right at the end, is Crichton from Red Dwarf. I'm currently indoctrinating my four-year-old and six-year-old children through watching Red Dwarf. And uh, Big Hero 6, anybody seen this? I recommend it. I went in thinking it was going to be uh, about fun and robots and ended up crying my eyes out because it was about loss and bereavement. And uh, if anybody thought about social care and looking after each other, well, Baymax would be a wonderful carer, I would have thought, as well as being a hero. Well, we love robots actually an awful lot. And fast forward on from Metropolis, we go to our next robot, which is Robbie the Robot. So in Forbidden Planet, we have... Um, a Shakespearean take, The Tempest. And Robbie the Robot um, obeys Isaac Asimov's three laws of robotics. A robot may not injure a human being through inaction, allow a human being to come to harm. A robot must obey orders given to it by a human. Human beings accept where orders would conflict with the first law. A robot must protect its own existence as long as that protection does not conflict with the first or second law. So these are all from a writer from science fiction. And interesting enough, what our science tells us about the human mind and the way that laws work, uh, and the way that Asimov wrote his books, was that these come into conflict uh, nearly always in these novels, and that somehow or other, what we need to resolve these things is an understanding of not just the laws, but the context and understanding of other people's minds, intentions, and so on and so forth, which is where psychology comes in. Um, the robot in Lost in Space was just called Robot, uh, but had a very similar design um, to Robbie the Robot. And then you have another one of my favorite robots, Marvin the Paranoid Android. Um, so many lines, you know, a brain the size of a planet, why stop now just while I'm hating it? Um, so um, we could go on and on. We really like robots. So anybody seen Westworld? So basically the, the reboot um, as well as the original. And here we have an idea of uh, a dystopian future where robots are not just our servants or slaves, they're our playthings. So once again, we have a look on uh, the darker side, I suppose, of human beings and what this might mean for us if we have a future somewhat like this. Um, this is, again, one of my favorite robots. This is uh, effectively a Homer Simpson in robot format. So this is Bender. Uh, blackmail is such an ugly word. I prefer extortion. The X makes it sound cooler. Afterlife. If I had had to live another afterlife, I'd kill myself right now. And one of the ones I use in team meetings and universities, I'm so embarrassed, I wish everyone else was dead. Um, so a great take on the future as well. And not forgetting cyborgs. So we have a whole list of things. Um, so we have Ghost in the Machine and the wonderful Robocop, which satirizes when corporate corruption takes over robots. So if anybody's not seen that film, especially the original Paul Verhoeven, this is about what happens when you privatize the police force and you bring in robots to do this. It's a wonderful satire. People thought it was all about robots, but it's actually sending up um, the idea of corporate America and what happens if you uh, start to privatize um, uh, public services. Uh, I'll leave you to think about that in terms of our current state. 
Um, you also have the wonderful um, Terminator, the first film, beautiful. And uh, I put in here data. I'm going to come to him later because um, Gene Rodenbury used him in a particular way to reflect on us in a similar way that he used uh, uh, Mr. Spock uh, to try and understand our emotions. So robots as our servants. So anybody familiar with Downton Abbey or Upstairs Downstairs, you have this differentiation between the upstairs people, the lords, the ladies, and the downstairs people, the servants. And if you think back to what the word, the word robot comes from, you might not be aware of this. It comes from um, the Slavic language. And uh, it was first introduced in the 1920s by a, a, a Czech surrealist called Karol Kapek in a play he wrote called Rossum's Universal Robots. And it comes from the Slavic roboti to mean to drudge, to do the donkey work. Um, servitude, um, slave, slavitude, it comes from that kind of um, sort of uh, background. So our very understanding of robots are there to serve us. And indeed, uh, Crichton from Red Dwarf um, directly comes, you can see, from the Admiral Crichton, which is a book by J.M. Barry and a film um, starring the wonderful Kenneth Moore. So we have this idea of servitude and things that are there to serve us. And once again, that reflects something interesting um, to our own psychology, I think, how we view robots and how we view our uh, relationships with them. This is a, an interesting character, uh, Hiroshi Ishiguro. Um, and Ishiguro um, is famous in the area and controversial in the area of robotics. Um, Ruth is going to talk a little bit more about the uncanny valley um, uh, phenomenon. And you might feel slightly queasy looking at the robots here because they have sort of, they're, they're, they've moved a long way from Robbie the robot and the archetypal robot silver shiny face look to looking much more human-like. And the Japanese culture is a very fascinating one because they have the concept of soul in a way that we don't. So for example, if the end of life of a, of a, of a tool or something like that, they'll bury it um, because it's been a wonderful servant towards them. And they try to understand robotics in a way that we, we arguably don't in the West. Um, they use it to try and reflect on themselves. What is it to have a soul? Um, and they use robotics and they use experiments and they um, use the building of, of robots, excuse me, uh, to understand us. So on the top right you have Erika, which is one of Ishiguro's most recent robots. Um, and then you also have Geminoid F, and then you have also uh, Ishiguro's own semblance of himself. So effectively, what he's trying to do is try and work out the nature of soul, the nature of our own existence, and at what point something has a life and something uh, doesn't have a life. Um, I won't bore you with too much philosophy, but this is René Descartes, and uh, we are still um, influenced heavily by Descartesian, Cartesian duality, this mind-body duality, and the idea that are we humans, are we beast machines, as he called us. So we argued that uh, people, humans, we, we are rational creatures, and uh, whereas the beasts, the creatures, have emotions. Um, and are we humans, are we machines in a way that are similar to robots but have souls? So the idea of understanding emotions is something that's very important to us um, as human beings, and uh, our understanding of robots helps us to better um, understand uh, where the delineation lies between understanding of mental states, understanding of emotions, in a way that we, we wouldn't know beforehand. This is a seminal text. Um, when I was uh, an undergraduate and master student written by my PhD supervisor, a man called Peter Mitchell. And at that time in psychology, we were trying to understand um, mental states, how we understand other people's emotions, how we understand why people do what they do, and the way we tried to do that was by looking at three areas. And one of them was children. So I'm a developmental psychologist, so I look at how children develop, at what point children start to understand other people as having a mental state, other people having emotions, feelings. Um, this usually comes online around about three, four, but we have the beginnings of this earlier in life, in infancy. We also try and understand what's going on in terms of mental states and theory of mind um, through looking at people with developmental conditions. So my other area of interest is in, is in autism. And the area of autism and robotics has really melded very well. 
Then we look at non-human primates, apes, chimpanzees, our closest cousins, our closest relations, um, and can we infer from their behavior that they have a uh, mental understanding in a similar way to humans? If I were to write this book again, I would add also robots, including virtual characters in, as an extension to this, because we understand ourselves better through understanding our interactions with robots. So this goes on to um, the other area of interest of mine and how uh, I'll try and show that these are related. What do people with autism tell us about ourselves? Um, there's a whole generation of children, unfortunately, uh, who don't know Sesame Street, including my children, but I grew up with it. And relatively recently, there was a, there was a uh, Muppet character called Julia who has autism. And she interacts in a certain way, so she has very um, sort of uh, rigid uh, requirements. Um, and she responds in a certain way, in a very literal way. But as a literary device, people uh, write characters with autism. So the wonderful, curious incident of the dog in the nighttime, which would be mentioned to play, and the girl with a dragon tattoo, even though she isn't named as having autism, she, she clearly uh, has autism, in, in my eyes at least. And um, the device that people use is, is very similar to how people use um, individuals, uh, how people use robots, for example, once again to reflect onto us various aspects of the human condition. So Conan Doyle clearly didn't know what autism was, um, but he wrote Sherlock Holmes to be a logical character, to be somebody who uh, made deductions. There was an absence of emotion. Arguably, Watson was the character with emotion, but, he, but the absence of emotion allowed him to make logical deductions to solve the crime. And data uh, in Star Trek, Star Trek The Next Generation is no um, coincidence that sometimes it became a Sherlock Holmes type character. And often his storylines were around emotion. And before him, Mr. Spock, as, as the Vulcan, often interacted with Kirk uh, in a way that suggested that uh, Kirk was far too emotional and couldn't solve things and it required logic. And often the resolution would happen uh, as a combination, i.e. they both needed the logic and they needed um, the human element. Um, they needed the emotional side of things. And um, you see here, this sort of Spock eyebrow, eyebrow raise, we can produce those kind of eyebrow raises with one of the robots that we currently use called uh, Emis. And Ruth will be talking a little bit about uh, the Emis robot uh, when it's her turn to speak. So how does, how does this work? How, does, how, how do we start to understand other people's mental states? Well, um, in the 1940s, Heidel and Simmer um, put forward uh, some animations in which geometric objects simply interacted with each other. And people were asked to make some sort of judgment about what went on. Fast forward to John Lasseter and the creation of Pixar Jr. So anybody seen the, the angle poise lamp bouncing up and down? Yeah, so very famous. So, the, so John Lasseter goes to these computer science um, conferences and shows this angle point lamp interacting. And uh, the computer scientists say, how do you program it to be, to be like that? How do you program it to be like a little child? And he realizes that computer scientists at the time didn't know the history of animation. So the history of animation works with us attributing life to these inanimate objects through the art of animation. And Wally here is a really good example. Not much dialogue, and this wonderful, I can't remember the name of the droid who has some sort of obsessive compulsive disorder of trying to clean up after Wally. When you give this social attribution task to um, neurotypical people, i.e., people without autism, what they come up with was arguments that involved mental state attribution. So these are just random geometric objects bumping into each other. And people say things like, what kind of happened was the larger triangle, which was like a bigger kid or bully, had isolated himself from everything else until two new kids come along, and the little one was a bit shy, more scared, and the smaller triangle um, more like stood up for himself and protected the little one. The big triangle got jealous of them, came out and started to pick on the smaller triangle. The little triangle got upset and said, what's up? What are you doing? And this is all inferred from this interaction. When you ask somebody with autism, they simply give a response about cause and effect. The big triangle went into the rectangle, there was a small triangle and a circle, the big triangle went out. So all the description 
uh, doesn't have the same sort of uh, emotion. And who's to say which is right or wrong? You can argue that it's the neurotypical person who's reading too much into this, whereas the person with autism is simply giving uh, a response which um, is arguably correct. So this gives us as an insight into the, the understanding of, of attribution. And neurotypical individuals arguably attribute too much, but this is, is how things work. So I'm not going to go into too much detail about this, but um, one thing we know that when we one thing we know when we ask children about robots is that they believe that they are a separate category. So we know that uh, children, for example, um, have this uh, notion that robots occupy this particular niche. So they know that they're not alive uh, in the way that humans are, but they attribute minds to them in a way that they don't to uh, non-living entities or even other animals. So these are the expressions. I won't go into too much detail. Ru uh, Ruth will talk about these. But these are the kind of expressions that we show um, from uh, the robot that uh, we're currently using. And the top half are all positive expressions, and the bottom are all negative. So as we move into an era of socially assistive robots, um, we're looking to uh, look for human augmentation. And socially assistive robots require <coughs> developmental psychologists like me, an understanding of autism and early childhood, and other more complicated things that belong in Ruth's world, like social signal processing and machine learning. So it requires a really multidisciplinary approach to produce robots that we, we love and want to work with. And finally, there's this big work looking at robots specifically in autism because of this, this unique way in which people with autism um, interact and allow us a window into the human condition, which allow us to both build better robots for them and better robots and better systems for us. So it's a win-win situation. And I've written at length uh, about this, how humans can, how robots can help us embrace a more human view of disability. Oh, sorry. Finally, I'll end with a, a little clip from one of my favorite programs, is Red Dwarf. Sit down, Brooke. There's something I must tell you. I wasn't with Simone that evening, Brooke. I spent the night with Gary. You ex-husband Gary? My business rival? What are you telling me, Kelly? I'm saying, Brooke Jr. What about Brooke Jr.? He isn't your android. Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, thank you, uh, Tusha, for such an interesting and insightful presentation. Uh, as I said earlier, you'll get the opportunity to ask some questions once we've heard from our next guest week, uh, speaker. But, uh, so please, could you welcome Professor Ruth Aylett? Thank you. Hi. Well, what I do, I describe as uh, social robotics. I research human-robot interaction. And what I want to do in this talk, really, is to tell you a little bit about this, what it is we think we're doing, and why we think we're doing it, and where we think that that is going. So, creating robots that care, that's one way of describing where we hope we might be going. Um, that's a technology issue, it's also a psychology issue, which is why we're doing these presentations together. And what are we trying to look at in social robotics? What is our key question? How can you put robots into ordinary human environments? That's not an easy question to answer. If you think about it, most of our human environments are entirely robotless. We have to invent answers to this question. The robots we know of are industrial, they live in factories. So, like that. All right, someone's having fun with it, but this is clearly not a robot you can put in an ordinary human environment. It's big and it's dangerous, and you wouldn't want to actually get in the way of that when it's moving. So, right, not like that. Well, here's another example. 
you can buy these, these little robot vacuum cleaners, which will zoom around. Um, do not, as far as I know, pass the Lego test. Anyone who's used a vacuum cleaner will know that Lego wedges just nicely in the underneath of a vacuum cleaner and burns your motor out. Um, a human, if they're if sensible, does not pass the vacuum cleaner over the Lego. This one doesn't know about that. And, and where's the social interaction? All right, it can zoom around the room and go and live in a cupboard, but it's kind of almost living in the house as if it was leading an independent existence. It's not really socially located. Well, this one isn't either, is it? This is a robot that does bomb disposal. Yes, it's used around humans. It's usually remotely operated. It's in an environment that's too hazardous for us to want to put a human in it because the bomb might explode and you'd rather the robot exploded into pieces than the human did. So in some sense, that's definitely not a human social environment. That's putting a robot where we don't want people to go at all. And even more so, this one is another robot. This is a cruise missile. I don't know if you think of cruise missiles as being robots, but they are. They autonomously navigate, they have um, a picture of where they're going, and they blow up when they get there. Certainly has an effect on the human environment, but clearly not the one that we are trying to study here. It's not a social impact, it's killing people. Okay, so not that one either. Ah, now this is a bit more like it. This is uh, the Lego Mindstorms kit that you can buy. And you can make your own little robots. Um, we have Lego Mindstorms competitions where groups of kids at primary school uh, compete to produce little robots that can do various um, tasks to do with leaping over things and carrying things and putting them down and so on. And that's more socially located, but it's very, very niche. It's toys. So robots as toys, yes. But here, in this case, we're building the robot. The robot doesn't have to do anything. We're doing things with it. So that doesn't really answer the question. This one I'm going to talk about. This is a robot used for therapy for people who don't get enough interaction because they're in old people's homes and they have dementia. And that's a much more plausible answer to the question. And what you're going to say to me is, that doesn't look like a robot. That looks like a furry animal. Well, yes. I'm going to come back to that point. It doesn't look like a robot in the usual sense. Ah, now here's a robot that's definitely doing something useful, except you might think, I'm not sure I want to be that person being picked up by a very large robot. You'd like to think it worked right. Um, in fact, that's not a person, that's a dummy. They were far too sensible to put a real person in that robot's arms. But that's getting a bit more like it. There's a robot doing something caring and something interactive with people. And that's really the picture that sums up a little bit more how I think we're trying to move in social robotics. Social interaction. Does this robot know when you hand it a bunch of flowers what you're doing? Does it know that flowers are a gift? Does it know that flowers are intended to impress you or delight you? Those are all things a human on the other end of that gesture would understand immediately. But would a robot? Or would the robot just go, oh, something to eat and put the flowers in its mouth? Yeah, so social robotics involves thinking about how you want your robots to interact, what you want them to do, and how people are going to perceive them. So, you saw a furry animal and you probably thought to yourself, no, I want my robots to look more like humans, don't I? If they're going to be around humans, they should look human. Well, not necessarily. I don't know about you, but I look at that one and go, don't like it. And why is that? There's something not quite right about that face. It's a lovely piece of engineering, incidentally, so I'm not knocking it. From a technology point of view, it's beautiful. It's uh, got all sorts of um, metal under the face to operate the face. It's got a latex skin. It's got nice nylon hair and so on. And the eyes are a bit too wide. That sort of white round the eye is a little bit unnerving. And the mouth is open in a not very nice way, and the lips are a bit shiny, and the face is kind of dead. It has no wrinkles in it. None of this you might notice consciously, but most of us will look at that face and go, oh, that doesn't look right. That doesn't look quite right. Why is that? That brings us to the point that you sort of refer to, what we call the uncanny valley. And this is why many of us say, no, things that look more human, that's asking for trouble. Why is this? So this was a hypothesis originally from a, a Japanese academic, 
And he hypothesized that if you look at appearance, and that's the black line there, and still more at behavior, in other words, you make the thing move, that's the dotted line there, as you start with something in the bottom, over at the left, that's not at all familiar, you don't know how to react to it. Yeah, it's like, well, it's alien. I, I don't know whether I should like it or not like it. As it becomes more human, more animal, more familiar, we start to like it more. Still more so when it behaves in a way that we like, in something that as, looks as if it might be alive, until we get to the point where it's quite near human. And at that point, you see a huge drop, and people going, as I showed you with that one just now, oh, I don't like that very much. We call that the uncanny valley. Obviously, if we got to the other side of the uncanny valley and this thing functioned exactly the same as a living thing or a human, we'd be fine. People would think it was great. Let me let you into a secret. Not much of a secret amongst people who do robotics, I will tell you. We cannot do that. We have no prospect of doing that in the immediate future. The more you do robotics, the more wonderful you see living things are, even quite simple ones. That means that the minute we start producing robots that look quite human, we fall into the uncanny valley. Something's not quite right about them. If it's not the appearance, then it's the behavior. Something that looks really human and moves with a jerk, because we're engaging our human capacity to respond to other humans when we do this. We use this capacity all the time, unconsciously, to react to each other. And when something's not quite right, it upsets us. Think of people who are drunk. You don't like them. You're not quite sure what they're going to do next. They're not quite right. People who have facial disfigurements suffer from these very negative reactions. And again, you may feel a very negative reaction, even though you know you shouldn't do. It's an instinctive reaction, which you can educate out of yourself. And again, it's because it doesn't look quite right. That apparatus you're using to engage with, with a human isn't quite working. Our well-known prejudices and bigotry about people who are not one of us, who look a bit different, yeah? We don't quite know how they're going to behave. All of that apparatus is involved in the uncanny valley. And because we're designing robots that are not going to work the way humans or animals do the same way, we have to be very careful not to fall into that uncanny valley. So this is why you'll see a lot of robots that don't look that human. And the ones that do, very many of them are a little bit creepy. really quite upsetting I find. There's an even worse one later. That's the worst one. <laughs> that one's not so good either. It's a baby with no proper arms. This one seems to have an OCD of some kind. That looks like Chokey in the film. Anyone seen that film? Yes, that's definitely, I don't like that one. So you see that plenty of us have managed to produce robots that fall smack into the uncanny valley. It's very easy to do that. So do we want things that are really naturalistic, that really look like nature's products, or do we want something we believe in as a character? These are not the same thing. That's natural. Okay. Can you interact with it? Well, it's a mouse, for Christ's sake. Yeah? It's going to run around the kitchen. Your interaction is probably confined to trying to catch it or throw something at it or run away from it. This, on the other hand, is a character, and a character we love, and a character we feel we know something about, and a character that we can identify with. And if you saw that running around the kitchen, you'd be rubbing your eyes and wondering what had been put into your last drink. But that's believable. It's not naturalistic but it's certainly believable. And in animation, you see this all the time. So here's another example. That's a line drawing. It's not a real gosling. This is the ugly duckling. Goslings don't look like that. I know, we have them on the pond at work. And you look at that, and not only do you believe in it as a character, you identify it with emotionally as well, and you can look at that and go, oh, the poor thing, it's upset, it's miserable. 
This is just the animator's art. This is lines, this is pixels, this is not real. And we know that. We know it's not real. We know it's not alive. And yet we're willing to believe in it. And believability is mostly what we're aiming for in robotics. Something that is believable as a character in a social role, but not something that's naturalistic, that's indistinguishable from the things we find in the animal or the human world. When we interact, we're often applying what we would call theory of mind. And again, Jusser uh, referred to this because it's a concept from psychology. Here's an illustration of what we mean by it. This is the Sally Ann test, and it's used as a diagnostic tool with children who, who may have an autism disorder. So there's Sally, there's Anne. There's a basket, there's a box. And Sally has a ball, puts it in her basket goes for a walk, and while she's out walking, Anne takes the ball out of the basket and puts it in the box. So the ball has now moved, and Sally comes back. She wants to play with her ball. Where will Sally look for the ball? Anyone like to tell me? In the basket or in the box? In the basket. Now, how do you know that? You know that because you've put yourself in Sally's shoes and you said, Sally wasn't there when the ball moved, so Sally doesn't know that the ball has moved, and so Sally is going to look for it where she last left it. You have used your theory of mind without even worrying about it. You just do that. Someone who has an autism disorder is more likely to say she will look for it in the box because they've seen it move to the box, and therefore they know it's in the box, and therefore everyone knows it's in the box. In other words, it's much harder for someone with autism to apply a theory of mind. There's a lot of discussion about this, but this is why it's used as a diagnostic tool with children. We do this all the time when we're interacting with things socially. This is why you get the uncanny valley, because you can't apply your theory of mind to something that's not quite right. And if you can't apply your theory of mind, inherently you have no idea what it's going to do next. And that's not a nice feeling. <coughs> What we're using quite often is what we would call social signals or expressive behaviour, and we're using this with our theory of mind to work out what's going on in there with that person. So facial expressions. We look at those pictures and we go, oh, yeah, the person on the left looks happy, the person on the right looks quite unhappy. And we would do that without thinking. You can just look at that and know this using a theory of mind. We use gesture quite a lot as well for intentionality. So we look at the person doing this and we think, oh, there's something about stopping. This person is clearly explaining something. That's a gesture that's often associated with explanation. We use glance a lot. So when we're interacting with each other, we use glance in very sophisticated ways. We look and we look away. When we're doing something together cooperatively, we may both look at the object, as you see in the bottom right there, that we're trying to do stuff with together. So we use glance to know whether we're focusing on the same thing and how we're interacting. And we also use even posture. So irrespective of the facial positions, you can tell that the person on the left has been defeated, and you can tell that the person on the right is celebrating even if I took the smile off the face, you'd still be able to tell that because of their posture. So again, we're processing this information all the time. So one of the things we do in social robotics is to try to give our robots this type of expressive behaviour. And we do this because we know that people want to apply their theory of mind to the robot. They want the robot to be transparent, if you like. They want to understand what the robot is about. And if they can't do that, they don't want it around them. So robots that are going to be in our ordinary human environments have to be visible to us and to our theory of mind. We have to know what they're about. So here's another video. And 
just to prove you don't have to be naturalistic. But our cartoon conventions tell us what those things mean. And you see that people are able to interpret those expressions well enough to be able to reproduce them themselves. So there is some kind of element of transparency. We know what the robot is trying to communicate there. We've tried this with our own version of that robot, which we call Alex, um, a couple of weekends ago in the Glasgow Science Centre, in fact. And what we're trying to do is to see whether people can read approval and disapproval of a robot. We had a little task where people offered Alex actually pl <coughs> plastic fruit and had to decide whether Alex wanted the plastic fruit for the breakfast or not and put it in a box saying like or dislike. <laughs> Terrible noise in the background. Okay. The next one was supposed to be a positive expression, but everyone thinks it's negative. You will too, I bet. Does Alex like ice cream? Yeah, the head shake makes people think Alex doesn't like ice cream. In fact, Alex does. So you can see that people are capable of interacting with these robots, even though they're not particularly naturalistic. What we're trying to think about is what we would call empathy. Do we know what people are feeling and do we respond to those feelings? If it's a robot, do we know what it's feeling and do we respond to those feelings? And what about the robot itself? Can it respond to our feelings? Can it do something which looks the sort of thing a human would do? So here we see uh, from expressive behaviour, we know the dwarf is sad because he's crying. Here we know, well, it's a sad scene, isn't it? So we know they're all sad. Again, we do this all the time without thinking. Here we are trying to do this with a, a very small robot. It's a chess playing companion in Portugal. <laughs> so the cat is being a friend of the person on the right and is therefore sad when she makes a bad move and sad when her opponent makes a good move. So it's sad because the opponent made a good move. So there you are, trying to make the robot empathic. If we're going to put robots into situations where they're fulfilling a therapeutic role, it's pretty clear that you have to do this kind of thing. I told you you'd see the seal again. Here's the seal in action. So this is being used in a hospice in America, I think. And this isn't a robot that does anything dramatic. It's responsive. It makes this weird noise. Lights being stroked. And people respond very, very strongly to it. So this is a robot that's doing something socially useful. It's trying to help people. They've, these have been used in Japan for elderly people who were traumatized by the tsunami and uh, other events. For elderly people who are not getting enough interaction because they're hard to interact with. So quite a powerful effect. And it's fairly simple. It's not what you would think of as a robot, but it's one that you can actually get and put in a situation and actually does do something good, does something useful. And just as a second example, very briefly, we've tried to apply this idea of empathy to a tutor. So here we have someone learning about mapping, and the robot is trying to act as a tutor, and we're using a sensor to decide whether the person doing the mapping task is happy or, or frustrated or bored, and the robot's trying to change its behaviour according to whether it thinks the person is happy, bored, or whatever. And a minute it decides they're bored and starts being a bit noisier, raising its arms, because he's not doing anything, telling jokes, and generally trying to engage him. There it is raising its arms. 
His jokes are terrible. I will, I'll give you that for nothing. Tell a joke, quick, try and engage them. Okay. Another example of the kind of thing we do in social robotics. Last slide here. You may worry about this question. I'm surprised at the number of people who do. Okay, will robots take over the world? Will the seals take over the world? Um, possibly not. Okay, three reasons why most of us in robotics would say, no way. Two rabbits and some lettuce in a hutch. Lots of rabbits. Pretty quickly. Do you know what it takes to build one of those? Okay. A factory, and we had to build the factory, and we had to mine the metal, and we had to make the equipment that mined the metal, and we had to, yeah? I could draw your pyramid with that robot at the top, and everything that had to be done, probably going back to about 1850, the start of industrialization, to produce something which allowed us to produce a robot. We're never going to reproduce robots the way rabbits reproduce. So that's definitely a problem, okay? If I give you a meal like this, even if you don't like it, and then I don't let you eat anything, you might have to have the odd drink of water for about three weeks, you will still carry on functioning. You won't like it, and you won't want to run around, but you can probably last about three weeks on that meal if you had to. People have done, okay? All of our robots run on batteries. Do you know how long a battery lasts in a large robot, even on wheels, if it's walking? half an hour. If it's on wheels, three or four hours. Yeah, sure, they'll take over the world as long as you can do it in three or four hours before the batteries all run out. Okay? So power supplies for robots, fundamental problem in robotics. No one worries about this. We worry about it. If a robot's going to be in a human social environment, are you going to have to recharge it every three hours? And it might take another three hours to recharge. Yeah, so it's a real problem. Slugs are very successful animals. Let me tell you, robots are not as good as slugs currently. It's not to say we can't do anything useful with them. We can. But in terms of success, ability to live on their own, support themselves, reproduce, eat the plants on my windowsill by clawing up the waste pipe. It's happened in one of my houses. Yeah? Robots are not as successful as slugs when it comes to autonomy. So we're not yet at the stage where we want to worry about them taking over the world, in my view. OK. Well, thanks very much, Ruth and uh, Tusha. We can now take some questions. Um, we've got two roving mics either side of the room. If I could just ask if when you want to ask a question, if you just wait for the microphone, uh, that would be much appreciated. So, first question. Anybody? Right at the back there. <clears throat> Good evening, and thank you very much for some fabulous stuff in there. Um, somebody mentioned, I think it was you, sir, that you mentioned the Asim Asimov's um, three laws of robotics. Mm -hmm. It's actually four, but I'll mention that. I'll come to that later. It's now 75 years since the, the laws of robotics were first proposed in a short story by him. Looking as far ahead as you possibly can, can you envision a time when we'll ever actually need laws of robotics? That's a great question. Um, from a psychologist's point of view, um, whenever you try and create some sort of algorithm uh, for human behavior or some sort of um, legal framework, it always comes to an end point where somebody has to make some sort of formalized decision. Um, so we might have a loose framework in terms of laws of robotics, but then it's always about the context. And the contextualization is the one that we find most difficult. That's why um, we're used to sometimes breaking the law in order for the greater good, if that makes sense. Or sometimes laws become outdated. Um, so I can imagine a future where there are parameters, but not, uh, uh, not the laws as, as Asimov suggested. I don't know if you want to add anything to that, Ruth. Yeah, I mean, it's a very difficult question. The thing is that the, the laws were far too simple, if you look at human social behaviour. Yeah, we're capable of doing some dreadful things. What we're talking about is ethical behaviour, really, here. Um, and, and primitive ethic behaviour is not 
hurting people, not killing people, not creating chaos around you and so on. But ethics is a very difficult field for humans, and once you put robots into human environments, and this is what a lot of his stories are about, um, the ethics become as complex as our own ethical problems do. So you might say a robot should never tell a lie. Okay? Um, right, there's a military coup. Your classroom robot um, is standing in the classroom, soldiers burst in, and they want to know if any of the children in there belong to whatever section of the population they're victimising. Is that child... Yeah, in World War II it would have been Jewish. Yeah? The robot does not say yes, even if that's true, because that's an ethical position. Yeah? Even on the small scale, if you're caring for somebody, if you're a robot in somebody's own house, and somebody has come in late last night and just gone to sleep on the sofa because they'd been in the pub for hours and they were a bit drunk, um, and someone says to them, were they drunk last night? Hmm, is yes the right answer? Um, or the classic question, does my bum look big in this? <laughs> yes is usually not the right answer, <laughs> in my experience. Ethical questions are difficult. So we have no choice but to confront them now, because any time you put robots into human social environments, you're going to confront ethical questions like that. Privacy, security, who, who has a right to know what. Yeah? So yes, now we have to worry about it, but not quite in the way Asimov did, would be my answer. Okay. Absolutely. Yeah, I agree. So some of these questions are not technical questions in a way that can be resolved in a, in a very easy formulaic way. They, have, they are deep-rooted questions that we have to kind of consider right now, um, as opposed to when the technology comes online in a way that is every day uh, in you know, 20, 20 years' time or whenever. OK. Thank, Thank you. you. Question over there. Just the microphone. About, Thank you. What about theoretical organic circuitry? So if a synapse sort of conducts electricity, so could you could you grow could you literally grow circuit boards? Um, are you alluding to the fact that humans are both um, electrical and organic? Uh, organic? Yes. Yeah, it's a very interesting question. So one of the ways that we try and understand the mind is through computational, so are, are humans, are we, do we reason in a way that we can um, understand in a, in a robotic way, are we just sort of um, input-output devices, but we're also organic and we're also neurochemical as well, and that gets a little bit more complicated. That's possibly why we are incredibly sophisticated in a way that robots and other uh, artificial intelligence systems aren't. Um, because we have also chemical messengers and other things going on in the endocrine system. And uh, to my knowledge, there's nothing that is close to being replicated in that. Um, I don't know if you have... Well, we don't anything. understand how it works is one of the problems. So we don't understand how brains work properly, even quite simple brains. We don't really understand exactly how it's working. Um, you can't grow things that you don't really understand. They just won't work. I mean, that's probably the bottom line. Until you understand what, what you're doing, there's no point. Uh, what people have tried to do, and again, for me, raises some ethical questions, is to combine some fairly primitive living things with electronics. So somebody, for instance, um, added some circuitry to a lamprey, which is a, a not very functional animal. It's quite a lowly animal. Um, so you've got the sort of... Cybernaut lamprey. Didn't do anything very interesting, because lampreys don't. Um, but at least there was some possibility of understanding what it did and using it, the output from its nervous system <coughs> to do something different. Um, so there have been experiments of this type, trying to combine living things with circuitry. We do this, of course, with humans in order to mend bits that are broken. So we stick in pacemakers, we stick in artificial limbs. We're starting to deal with paralysis by routing electrical connections from the break in the spine down to um, appliances further down the body and so on to help people learn to walk again. 
but we, we understand too little about how we're doing this to be able to do it very well. I suspect that the gears and motors, um, the computer in a box version of a robot is inherently limited. It's never going, we're never going to solve the power problem for a start. I doubt that we're going to solve the mobility problem. Uh, these things are just not flexible or mobile in the way slugs, as I said, have a lovely squeezy action. They can squeeze into little crevices because they're, they're squidgy things. So I suspect that living things are highly superior to robots. I, I'm a little bit concerned about where some of that engineering might go once you start in, involving living things mm -hmm. and engineering them. Um, then I think the ethical issues get a little bit more serious. Mm. Cheers. Okay, thank you. We've got time for two more questions. So, this gentleman at the front. <clears throat> thank you. you. You were describing how um, robots can give the impression of human emotions so that people can interact with them. But underneath, uh, the robot isn't really feeling those feelings. Is, is there a problem there that it's, it's fundamentally a lie that you're projecting? Yeah, I mean, this is true of artificial intelligence in general. Um, artificial intelligence isn't intelligence. Modeling of emotion is not emotion. You can model rain, it isn't wet. Um, the problem you have is that people impute social agency and you cannot stop them doing it. So, the Paro robot, I've got a, a film called Mechanical Love, which shows the Paro being given to a woman in a, when it was being tested in a German old folks' home. And they show her the robot, they turn it upside down, they unzip the robot, they show her the mechanics inside. She is in no doubt whatsoever that this is not a living thing, okay? It's a robot, it's a piece of equipment. They give it to her. She treats it exactly like a living thing. People running the old people's home get really furious because she's so attached to it. Yeah, she obviously hates being in the home, I would say, looking at the film. You can't stop people doing it. <coughs> it's our problem. So you're right, yes. It's not a real thing. Any more than Mickey Mouse is a real character. Yeah? Do we feel that we are doing something really evil when we show people a film... Yeah? And we see characters doing all kinds of things that don't happen in the real world. You have heroes being heroic and villains being villainous. We do this all the time. We fictionalise everything around us. Mm. But you can't stop people doing it. I think, sort of, take Descartes. In the Descartes world, you have this idea of, I think, therefore I am, you know, the very thought. But I think it was... Um, so there's one way of viewing human, human existence in terms of thought, but that's, there's a lack of emotion there. And there's a nice quote by, I think it's um, Hugo von Hoffmannsthal, who was the librettist for Richard Strauss, who said, where does reality lie uh, in the greatest enchantment you have ever known? So there's another view of reality. The reality of, of our existence is, is, is emotional, and we can infer emotions, but does that make it any less real? No, it's, it's our perception is, you know, in a way, our brains are, are doing all this for us. You know, you're, this whole, you're, we're in the matrix. You just, we just don't know it. <laughs> your, brains are, you know, your brains are producing this wonderful, smooth um, world in which everything is happening um, in a way that uh, we can interact with. But the reality is, just from our vision point of view, it's all jerky, it's upside down, it's small, but just the, our perception of the world. So in a way, it's a, it's a beautiful illusion uh, that we live in, but nevertheless, it's, it's, it's real. Okay. That's a good question. And we've got one more question, if anybody wants to ask. Gentlemen. Just one question. Who's in your opinion is the biggest athlete to be now? Who's the biggest employer for the graduates um, studying robotics, graduating, graduating in robotics at the moment? Depends what sort of robotics you're talking about. So there's a whole field of industrial robotics where you're dealing with factories which have been wholly engineered round robots that have no sensors to speak of and just do repetitive actions, okay? Uh, the biggest employers of those people are the companies that make industrial robots, which Britain doesn't have one anymore, um, mostly in Asia, uh, where there's a huge industrialization of manufacturing, uh, so car factories also, um, large-scale manufacturing, which we don't have anymore in this country to speak of, okay? So those are the people who employ industrial robotics people. Social robotics is new, 
The employers of social robotics are those people who want to do things with it. Um, automatic cars, so your Googles, your Ubers are investigating it, but it's still early days. Um, service robotics, um, companies making appliances like the vacuum cleaners and so on. Um, so it's still quite experimental industrial research, that kind of robotics. I suspect that you will find niche products like the Paro um, appearing, where you will get particular companies targeting particular sorts of applications for this type of robot, and they'll be the big employers. I would say jump onto it now if I was running the UK. I have said this when anyone's asked me in, in the UK. Jump on this now, make the UK a world leader in social robotics because you've missed out on the industrial robots, good and proper, you're not going to get back there again. Get into social robotics before it becomes big. Okay, thank you very much. And that brings this evening's session <clears throat> to a close. Um, so thank you very much to the audience, to you, the audience, for participating this evening. And of course, uh, thanks goes to Ruth and Tusha for giving up their time to speak to us tonight. So thank you very much. Uh, our next Innovation Nation is on Tuesday the 1st of August on the timely theme of Innovation Festivals when we welcome Festivals Directors Fergus Linehan, Shona McCarthy and Ken Hay who will talk about the history and future plans of their respective festivals ahead of the start of the Edinburgh International Festival and the Edinburgh Festival Fringe. So we hope to see you there, and in the meantime, uh, feel free to uh, join us for a complimentary drink outside where you get to ask some more questions of our guest speakers this evening. So thank you very much.